Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us here for another episode. Wherever in the world you're listening to us from, whatever platform you're listening to us on, as always, thank you guys so much for the support, the messages, the love that you sent the show's way, the questions you've sent the show's way. Keep those coming. Thank you guys so much for checking this one out. And as I was just talking to my guests before we started recording, always excited when I have the opportunity to talk defense and get into that side of the ball. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. We'll talk about uh, no middle defense, which I know is something that's uh, really popular right now and that a lot of coaches are either implementing or looking to implement. And so depending on where you're at, either well, you'll, you'll learn about what it is, how to implement it and what it kind of looks like, or uh, maybe some tips and, and tricks a little bit on the refinement side of this defense as well. So excited to be joined by the assistant men's basketball coach at the New Mexico Military Institute. Very happy to be joined by Coach Corey Hoff today. Coach, appreciate you coming on. How are you doing tonight? Coach, I really appreciate you having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Excited to talk defense and talk basketball and and kind of give some knowledge. So th things are going well, and I'm excited to get started here. Awesome. Coach, let's start with uh, your journey, your basketball journey, your coaching journey. Where did the game of basketball take you? Where did your coaching journey take you? And ultimately, how did you end up at New Mexico Military Institute? Yeah, first off, you know, I just want to thank you for what you're doing with the coaching community. Uh, I think it's really important that we have avenues as coaches to really grow and learn in this profession. And you kind of provide this platform that allows us all to benefit. So I appreciate the opportunity appreciate to be here it, with you. you and, uh, you know, just kind of talk hoops a little bit. So I've got a very unique journey and I hope that kind of given my background, it shows others that you can get where you want to go. You know, I, did, I didn't have a family member that was a college coach. I didn't play in college. You know, I was a high school player. And it mm. took me about six or seven years to finally get my bachelor's degree. So hopefully with my background, you can see that you can still make things happen. And so I was born in Virginia, but I grew up in a small town, Deckerville, Michigan. It's about a town of roughly 2000 people right off of Lake Huron. Played high school basketball there, played some other sports, but I, I was an average player. You know, I, I kind of knew what where I stood and I knew that I wanted to stick around the game. And I figured coaching was going to be the best opportunity I just didn't know how to get into it. So mm -hmm. I ended up going out to Arizona. I transferred out to Arizona State University and I was there for a semester and ran out of money basically and dropped out of school. And so I started working full time and I was out of school for about three or four years. You know, I met my wife at Arizona State, uh, my wife Tatum. You know, we had a kid. I was working two full time jobs, you know, 90 hours per week. And I was, <sighs> I knew I had to get my degree because I wanted to so serious about coaching. I wanted to pursue it. And so I ended up going to MCC Mesa community college for a year and transferred back to Arizona state to complete my bachelor's degree. And so I ended up getting that in exercise and wellness. And while I was there, I had to do an internship my senior year. And so, okay, I thought this was a great opportunity to try to find a way to get into coaching. So I hit up ASU, tried to catch on with them. You know, they, they weren't really interested and so I reached out to the staff at Mesa Community College, where I went before I went to ASU. And that phone call has shaped the path of my career. You know, Coach mm -hmm. Sam Ballard, he's a Hall of Fame coach, leg legendary coach, took my call, had me come in and meet him. And he allowed me to essentially be a volunteer assistant for a year um, as I got my degree. So I wasn't paid anything. You know, I worked in a warehouse in the mornings, showed up did everything I could, soaked up all the knowledge I could, learning from them. You know, I still have the notebook that I carried with me when I was taking notes and learning that <laughs> first year. That's incredible. And, um, yeah, yeah it, it's something I keep with me in my, in my desk drawer here in my office. And so I was there for a year, and then our head assistant took a local high school job and had an opportunity to replace him. And so, you know, I thought this was great. I'm getting into college coaching. You know, I'm making $5,000 a year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. To be a college coach, I'm uh -huh. married to a kid. Um, 
And, you know, so that was a, it was a struggle, but I did that for three years because I loved the coach that I worked for. I loved the opportunity. I knew I had to get in and get started. And so, you know, I was teaching classes. I'd work on campus, work in the fitness center, finding odd jobs, working camps and clinics, whatever I could do to make it work. And we had a lot of success there. I, I love the guy I was working for, but I always kind of was curious about the four-year level. Mm -hmm. So had an opportunity to get back to the Midwest and join the staff at Graceland University. It is a small NAI. And I was there for two seasons. My second season, I was the associate head coach. And we made the national tournament for the first time in school history. And we actually ended up hitting a game-winning three to win the national championship. That's incredible. <laughs> it, it was. It, it was great. We were the number one play on Sports Center top ten that night, and um, great experience. And so my head coach had an opportunity to move on, and they asked me to replace him. Mm -hmm. So you know, wife enjoyed the area. We were happy. Um, kids were happy, and so I spent three years as the head coach at Grayson University, and so. Around that time, you know, going into that third season, my priorities kind of shifted. And, okay. you know, I, I had all these things I wanted to check off. You know, I wanted to win a national championship. Uh, I wanted to be a head coach by the time I was 30. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to win a conference championship. And I had done all these things. And I started to realize, you know what, I wanted to get back to family. We wanted to return back to the Southwest. And so, we made the decision to move back to Arizona and, you know, didn't know what I was going to do with coaching. Didn't have anything lined up, but I just knew that uh, family had to take the priority after I'd been putting coach ahead, coaching ahead mm -hmm. of it so long. And so I was back for a few months and started to look at my career. And one thing I wanted to get better at was player development. And so I reached out to a guy in Phoenix named Phil Beckner and I worked for him for six months, volunteering for him, and basically got a PhD in player development. I mean, <laughs> you talk about a guy that gets it and works and is high level. Um, it, it was unbelievable the things that I got to see him do and the players he worked with. And it was so easy to see why he is so highly sought after. He, he's trains NBA guys. I live in Phoenix, so I I I, I know him. Yeah, he trains. <laughs> he's, he's worked with NBA. I think he's worked with Damian Lillard before, and, uh, and some of these other guys. Yeah, yeah. That's his. That's his big. Uh, you know, guy that he's known for. But he's got a lot of them. You know, Mikael Bridges mm -hmm. and Cam Johnson, and so, um, and, and he does a great job. You're in the gym with him, and you watch how he works and the attention to detail, and and it makes sense. And so. I did that for six months and I started to get the itch. I wanted to get back into coaching. Um, you know, I, I love this, but I miss the relationships. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I'm super competitive. So to be honest, I miss the scoreboard. <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. I miss the competition piece. And so right around that time, Skyline High School out in Mesa, Arizona, mm -hmm. uh, is right down the street from me. It happened to open up. And so, you know, as fate would have it, you know, I called up the athletic director, said, you know, I was interested in getting back into coaching. You know, I wanted to make sure that this is something I really wanted to do. And so I spent a year at Skyline High School and, you know, enjoyed it. We had a lot of success. You know, we won um, the most games in three years that they had won. And, you know, our defense, we gave up 15 less points per game on the season. And so, we did a lot of good things, and I realized that what I missed, not just coaching, it was the college piece. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I started to kind of look around, and, you know, I, I've been very fortunate in my career where, you know, I fall into some good places. You know, that happened at at Mesa Community College, and, and what, around this time, you know, I started, I was talking with a coach about a job on their staff, and my wife's grandfather got diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. and so... He was in the Mesa, you know, Mesa area as well. And so I decided, well, we couldn't just pack up and move the family halfway across the country with that going on. And so we we stayed and, and I'm glad we did, because unfortunately, a month later, he passed away. And so, again, with priority shifting, family important, I was glad we got to have that month with him. Yeah. And about a week after the assistant spot at New Mexico military opened up. And so. You know, I put I put in an application. It was on a a Wednesday, 
or it was on a Thursday, that Friday morning, I get a call from the head coach, Coach Schooley. And just so happens to be he is in Phoenix for his son's AAU tournament. Oh, wow. And <laughs> said, why, why don't you come over <laughs> and let's talk? And so I went I, that same day, that Friday, he called me, you know, late morning. I went there that night. I met with him and we talked and you could we clicked right away. You could tell our philosophies lined up. Uh, we stood for the same things. He's an experienced coach, and they play in Region 5, which is one of the best regions in the country. And it worked out after a couple weeks of you know interviewing and doing some different things that he offered me a spot on his staff, and, mm. and that's kind of what led me here. That's incredible journey, and I had no idea how, how local you were to me being in the Phoenix area. That's 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 incredible, and, and, and to have uh, just, just the way that, the the timing of everything works out right that's it's the old adage right timing is everything and uh it sounds like that was definitely the the, the case the case for you where like you said the, all of these uh stops that you've had along the way were were just great opportunities and 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 ones that wouldn't have happened unless a specific set of circumstances happened to work out yeah it, just very fortunate and sometimes that's the way it works and you have to be ready when that opportunity calls and i've just mm -hmm. been very fortunate, you know, being around Coach Ballard, a, a great coach, learning from him, and now Coach Schooley being around him. And I've just I've learned from some really good coaches and I've just fell into some really good spots. And you know, as it goes, sometimes you need some luck. And I've been fortunate <laughs> to have some of that on my side. I wanted to ask you about the uh culture uh piece, especially at at, at the institution you're at right now because that is a kind of a unique situation to be in to be in a in, in a military institute I'm, I'm really kind of curious about um culture and standards i i want to start by asking about the standards and the culture of of the program right now and how does the overall school philosophy kind of meld with the uh basketball culture that you and your staff want to build as well you know I have, I have a thing for unique situations, I guess, <laughs> schools. Um, you know, I was at Mesa Community College and we were a division one junior college, but we had partial scholarships. We didn't have dorms. We didn't have meal plans. We couldn't scholarship out of state kids. And so we were competing against a level that can provide all that. And then at Graceland University, a town of 2000 people, rural Iowa, they had never been to the national tournament before. And then now I'm at, you know, New Mexico Military Institute. Obviously, they're a military institution. And so they kind of get it from both sides here. And from the school standpoint, they have standards that you must follow while you're here as a student. You know, you have to wear the correct uniform to school every day. You know, they've got curfew, lights out. You've got to wear school colors when you're on campus. But there's no military commitment to it but they must live those daily standards while they're a student athlete. Okay. And so they've got three core values here, you know, honor, duty, achievement. Those are the big ones that they preach with everything that they do. And then on the other side of things, they've got the basketball standards. Sure. And so for us, you know, it's, it's being on time, uh, being coachable, treat others with respect, uh, go to class, maximize yourself academically. And so, you know, we have those in place. And then for there to be accountability for that, you've got to have follow up and follow through. And so what I mean by that as a coach, we have to live and emphasize and demand those standards. So leading by example, ensure those, those ex expectations are met. So if you're if you demand high energy and effort every day in practice as a coach you better have high energy and effort every day in practice yeah for sure and i think that's the toughest thing if you're going to be a, a coach or a program with high standards as a coach that's the toughest thing is because you are the standard and you're the standard every single day and so to, if someone isn't meeting those standards, I do think I kind of go with the philosophy you have to be willing to confront and demand. And I think successful organizations, not just sports, but you're talking business, anything like that, there's healthy conflict within them. And so everybody views confrontation as something negative. But if it's a positive approach, you're trying to redirect 
behaviors and change habits, I think it's a positive necessary component. And so something that I take a lot of pride in as a person, as a coach, uh, you know, I think I have really high standards with everything that they, that I do. I'm constantly trying to raise the bar and meet them. And so I know that can make, sometimes that makes you a tough person to coach for, uh, a tough person to work with. But I think that's the best way for us to teach life lessons to our players. That's going to take them beyond basketball because uh, let's be honest, basketball, it's just a tool that allows me to teach players how to be better students, athletes, citizens, future husbands and fathers. Um, and so that's why we really preach accountability and holding guys to those standards. And I, t I know sometimes it's, it's not always easy to be the one who's living up to that standard, especially, uh, when you're when you got a lot going on on your plate and a lot of other things maybe happening outside of basketball, but no, I I completely agree that you need to be the the, the standard of that standard, so to speak. And I think for uh, really successful coaches, I know who I've interacted with, not only have they um, embodied that philosophy of, of of being the standard that they expect from their team, but also, um, and I'm sure you you've had experience of this as well, like be willing to be called out and talked to or confronted as you, as you might say, when that coach isn't living up to that standard and, or isn't, you know, following through by living the message that they're preaching. That's why it's so important who you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. You have to have a staff that is not just a yes, man, that'll tell you what you want to hear, but will hold you. If you're not living up to that standard that they help raise you and lift you up, maybe you're having a bad day. Um, maybe you just don't feel it. It was a long night and out on the road recruiting and you got in late or whatever it may be. Who you surround yourself with is so important. And that was one thing that was really important to me when I was looking for my next stop, getting back to the college level, was I needed to be around someone that was going to help me become a better person, a better coach, a better husband, better father by raising my standards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, abs absolutely. And I think that if you have everyone on your staff who is bought into that and, and wholeheartedly believes that, then every everything about your program, I, I would I, I would argue, gets gets infinitely better because everybody's on the same page with that piece. So so that that's awesome. Um, as we kind of move into the aspect of, of this topic, and I, I know buy-in is going to be very important for this as we kind of shift into uh, talking a little bit about defense, I, I guess I'll start uh, first by asking the the idea of a, a, a no middle defense. Is that something that has always been a part of your uh, coaching DNA when you were an assistant or head coach or otherwise? I guess uh, what, what was the kind of the journey of, of embracing and uh, re really buying into and, and having a team that does the no middle defense? You know, I've had the opportunity. I've worked for coaches in the past that have ran or preferred the no middle philosophy. And then I've also worked for a coach that ran the pack line philosophy. So I, I've seen both sides of things. You can win with both. I mean, look at Virginia, look at Kansas. They proved that. Two completely different styles, Virginia running the pack line, uh, Kansas no middle, and they both won national championships recently. And so you asked the question, why did it work for them? Well, they believed in it. They bought into it. They were committed to it. Uh, they invested in it. And so I, I think when you're developing your defensive philosophy, it all comes down to preference, and you got to find a philosophy that aligns with your values. So for me, if I'm looking at the most basic level of my defensive philosophy, I looked at offenses and a lot of them are all geared to attack the paint, get into the middle of the floor. So for me, all right, if offenses are generally designed that way, why wouldn't I want to build a defensive philosophy that combats that? So I've just naturally gravitated towards that no middle defense. And so to really drive that home, you know, I, I worked for one of the best defensive coaches in the world. You know, when I was coaching for Sam Ballard at Mesa Community College, that's really what laid the foundation for me as far as my defensive philosophy and, and you know, taking what I liked from what he did and building it and making it my own. And so, you know, what that philosophy kind of looks like, it's putting pressure on the ball 
and four other defenders are loaded up towards the ball. And so we ask our guys, I need you to be able to slow down the ball and guard the ball for one or two attacking bounces, and then some type of help will be there. And so it's a little bit different when you're looking at the no middle because you have to be, you have to be willing to kind of live in rotations a little bit and with help situations in that philosophy. And so for me, I just feel like we can force our opponents into a shot profile that we want defensively with this philosophy and rotations. And so, but you've got to have tough players that are bought into what you're trying to accomplish and willing to really commit to this to make it work. And so that was going to lead me to to, to my follow-up question about that at the at the collegiate level. Are you looking for guys who um you you think can buy buy into this system? Are you looking for guys who uh, on film or or tape or whatever the case may be show that they already have the ability to be in this system? What kind of goes into uh getting players at the collegiate level who you really think will be a good fit for it? You know, when we want to recruit college players to fit our defensive system. We're looking for tough minded kids. Huh. That's really what it comes down to. Gritty, tough kids are the ones that are willing to stick their nose in there defensively. And so you look for wingspan and athleticism and quickness and all of that, but there has to be a willingness for them to guard and defend. And so will they fit? You know, we feel like with our system, we can put guys into positions to be successful if they're smart and they understand what we're trying to accomplish. But it's really tough to plug a kid into the system if they're not willing to sacrifice and buy in and be tough on that end. You know, if, mm -hmm. if there's no commitment, if you don't see it on film, um, you know, when you talk to them, you just don't get the feeling that they're going to buy into that because this is going to be the backbone of our program it's probably not going to be a good fit for us. Yeah. And it's one of those, one of those instances, right? Like if a player, and I think that that goes in many aspects when recruiting players, right? If you get players who you think can buy in, who really want it, and obviously the physical tools help, but if you, if you know, they have that mental or emotional, you know, commitment and, and that sort of energy that they bring, it's almost a, kind of a situation where you feel like you you can you can make anything work if they have the work ethic and the drive to to want to be successful at it. I think that's so important because, and you've seen it, you see it at all levels, talented, athletic players that don't defend on that end or they aren't committed to <laughs> yeah. it. And so you've got to have, I, I just come back to tough kids. You've got to have tough, gritty kids that are willing to do it because playing defense is hard. You know, the, we tell our guys all the time, you know, everybody wants to play 30, 40 minutes a night, and that's great. But how we ask you to guard and defend, it's impossible. You're exhausted after five minutes. And so you've got to have tough kids that are willing to buy in on that level. And if not, it's just never going to work for you. When these players are coming into your in, into your program and when you're when you're implementing and 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 teaching these players who are coming in uh about the no middle defense what are you and the staff do you find need to do to sort of reprogram them or or get them physically and mentally uh where they need to be so that they can actually be in this defense and be successful you know there's such a jump and the intensity, sure. the effort, the level of detail, uh, the commitment to defense when you transition from high school to college. And the game is faster. Uh, the players are more skilled. They're more athletic. Passing windows are smaller. Driving lanes are smaller. And so that's the biggest jump that we see or biggest reprogramming that we have to do with the guys is that it's just – the game is moving a hundred miles per hour for them on that end of the floor. And so it's just helping them slow down and understand things. And so one thing for me, I'm really big on definitions okay. and finding everything to provide clarity and eliminate confusion. So I think it's crucial day one that you clearly define. This is what I mean by play hard. Everybody has different definitions of it. 
This is what I mean being committed to defense. Um, this is the level of detail that we require in this program. So, uh, for example, playing hard, I've got a five minute clip, you know, cut up of clips, a little montage that we put together that we show them. This is what we when we say play hard. This is what we mean at New Mexico Military Institute. So that way there's no confusion. It's it's getting on the floor. It's taking charges. It's, you know, running the floor in transition. And we lay everything out and we define it. Because I think once you take away that confusion and you clarify things, uh, it allows them to play a little bit more freely. And they understand of what you're trying to accomplish. And so for us, we're showing them our defense and all of that. And it's not the pretty thing. You know, it doesn't show up on the mixtapes and the highlights a lot of the times and whatnot, but we show them the importance of it, how it can help us win. And at the junior college level, if we're winning, it helps you go where you want to go. Sure. Yeah. You know, it helps us get them to that next level. So I'll kind of give you an example of that. So this okay. past weekend, uh, we had our first jamboree down at Dallas. And so it's this massive event. I think there's like 60 teams there. Uh, there's a ton of NCAA Division One and Division Two coaches there watching and evaluating. Now, granted, you know, it was two 20, 22 minute running halves per game, but defensively, we gave up 42 points, 41 points, 38, and 37. And so it helped to show our guys and it confirmed what we're doing defensively that when we do it right, it works. And so it would just kind of reinforced what we've been doing for those first eight weeks of practice and why we're committed to this end. And when we do it right, you're going to be tough to beat. Going back to the, the practice part that you just touched on. And and I think that it's, it's really good when like, like you just kind of mentioned, right. When they can now see like, Oh, all this work that we've been doing in practice. And now that I know what hard work is and I've, I, I understand the, the terminology and what's going on and these definitions. And it's like, man, this is fantastic. When I actually seeing, see it pay off on the court. Um, let's talk about the, the, the practice stuff. So now we got players, they, they got the definitions. They, they really want to play defense, but they're, they're just, They've just never been in the system before. They 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 just don't have the maybe maybe the, the the basketball knowledge yet when they first come into the program. So when you're working with your players and you're working on your defense in practices, what are the things that um are are the teaching points, the the things that you maybe are are constantly needing to reinforce? What is that kind of uh the complicated and sometimes dirty process in the beginning of, of trying to get the players to, to really get this down in a practice situation. You know, the number one thing for me is I have to remind myself to be patient. Yeah. <laughs> it's, Definitely. it's not a, it's not a complex system, but it is very detailed. And so, you know, I can remember our players at Mesa community college telling us, it took until the second semester until they really felt comfortable with, with our system. And so I always have to remind myself, patience, patience, they're learning, they're growing. <laughs> and, and you take the little moral victories, you know, throughout practice. So that's the number one thing. But for me, it's again, it's those defensive principles. What are they? What are you emphasizing? And so some of the ones that we really hammer, uh, you know, we talk about defending without fouling. Uh, showing your hands on drives. Uh, you got to have a commitment to rim protection. Uh, know your personnel on closeouts. And so, you know, I'll, I'll kind of touch on those a little bit. You know, defense without following, following. It's it's built on defensive positioning, your footwork, discipline. Our guys hear me harp on them all the time about your closeout angles and closing or opening your stance, showing your hands on drives you know, beating them to a spot, cutting them off with your chest. And so I think those things are really important. And then talk about rim protection. So that can be accomplished a few different ways. You know, if you got shot blockers, vertical contests, taking charges, I think it takes toughness to, you know, protect the rim because open layups just kill defenses. Uh -huh. So moralizing too. It is, it, you know, you see the, the, the body language change and the demeanor change and it, and it seems to linger for a couple possessions. And so I think that's, it's, it takes a lot of toughness and, 
I know this is probably going to ruffle some feathers because I know in the basketball community, there's a lot of people that are against taking charges. Um, I think taking a charge is the best play in basketball. You know, I, really? I think, yeah. Okay. And, and here's why I think you sacrifice for your team. You frustrate an opponent, you force a turnover, you draw a foul, and usually there's some type of shift in momentum. And so, you know, if you're teaching the proper technique, the risk of injury is, you know, so, so low. I know people are, they don't want to practice charges because they're worried about that. And, and this year we've had to emphasize it a little bit differently because, you know, they've changed, they've tweaked the block charge call. It's the hardest call for refs. I don't envy them when they have to make it, but now you've got to be in legal guarding position. You got to be set before that offensive player gathers on their less last step to make a play. So you know, we've we've made some adjustments there on how we teach it, but it's if you're not blocking shots, if you're not vertical contesting, that's a third way to try to protect the rim. And then the last one, closeouts. Got to know your personnel. I think it's one of the toughest things for defenders to do right and consistently is having a proper closeout. It's just I don't know if what, it's not. What do you what do you see? What do you see wrong on the closeouts? You know, I it's 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 a tough play. It's a really tough play for you to be in a help position and you've got to sprint out and, and take away either a shot or a drive when the offense has the advantage. And so sometimes it's just not taught enough. Sometimes it's maybe it's just not emphasized enough because it's it's not that pretty play in basketball. But you know, for us, we work on closeouts every day. And our guys understand you're you're not gonna close out the same to Steph as you would on Draymond like there's we hammer it every day you could have different type of closeouts based on personnel and scouting reports and that's why we say you know know your personnel, personnel. closeouts mm -hmm. yep and so when you are watching uh the, the, these things on on defense because it because it is uh there's a lot going on right you just kind of talked about some of the terminology and and even something like closeouts um when when we're working on these things in practice what is the kind of kind of the structure look like or, or how do you how do you kind of build up to the defense are there things that are being done uh ev every day in practice are there are there things that are maybe being emphasized at more points in the season than they are in other points of the season how does how does the the layout or the structure of practices kind of like build or progress throughout the year so you have to prioritize defense if, if yeah. you're going to make a commitment to it so when you're designing a practice plan at minimum, at least 50% of your work has to be on the defensive end. And so you can do this a few different ways. Sometimes maybe it's just strictly a defensive drill. Uh, for me, I like a lot of dual purpose stuff where you're, you know, focusing on multiple actions, segments, ideas, uh, offense, defense. And so, you know, when you do that, maybe your staff has it set up where you have an offensive and defensive coordinator where, one assistant is just watching the defensive side, or maybe you switch it up each drill so you're getting different you know, eyes on it. But if you're going to commit to it, you have to have a way to track it and hold it accountable in practices. So if you're talking about closeouts or defensive rebounding, whatever is important to you, you've got to have an ability to track that so you can hold guys accountable to that. And so I think that's big for for practices and then how you structure it out. You know, for me, I've kind of got what I call a core four and okay. it's stuff that you work on every single day. And so for me, and that's not just offense, defense, you know, co my core four going to be defensive rotations, uh, pick and roll defense, defensive rebounding into transition, and then offensive spacing. And so those four things we work on every single day. So it, not always the same way, but those are the four points of emphasis that our program is really built on. And then we've kind of got a, I would say it's like a four defensive mantras that we talk about with our guys looking just at the defensive side where, you know, first one, high hands, high active hands. Second one is championship communication. Third one is five guys in a stance ready to guard. And the fourth one is next right thing. And so what I mean by next right thing is that bad things are going to happen. Okay. Someone's going to miss a rotation. Someone's going to be out of position. 
uh, you find yourself out of position, what is the next right thing that you need to do? Okay, maybe it's help the helper or, uh, you know, you get blown by in a closeout and you try to get back to the guy's hip and try to get back in front. So bad things are going to happen. What's the next right thing that you can do to fix it or try to correct it? Uh, I definitely just just wrote that down because I think I'm going to be stealing that one, Coach. Hope you don't mind. Absolutely. That's what you're here for. <laughs> Defense, like the deep, any defense, right? And any defense requires a high level of effective communication. And I know every coach listening always wants their teams to talk more, especially on the defensive side. And so I, I have to ask about the role that communication plays in this defense and, and what you and the staff do to really make sure that your guys are talking. It's a really important, crucial piece of defense. So I think that each defensive possession, it needs to be a constant conversation amongst your five defenders. You know, there, there's no such thing as a successful silent defense. Mm -hmm. So we really prioritize teaching our players what they're supposed to be saying, and then we hold them accountable to it. So we emphasize communication every single day. You know, we said the second mantra was championship level communication. And so we want our talk to be so loud that it disrupts what the other team's trying to do. They're not used to it, kind of makes them uncomfortable, throws them off guard. And also, if I am on the ball and I hear four other guys talking to me behind me in position and telling me where the help is at, I get confidence that I can press up on the ball because I know I got four teammates behind me that are ready to help. Not, not on an island, right? <laughs> exactly. You're not you hear crickets back there and you get a little nervous. You don't know what's going on. And so I think that's really important. And so for me, the biggest gap in communication is that you must teach your players what they need to see, what they need to say, excuse me. Um, too many times coaches, they'll tell their players, you need to talk more. You aren't talking out there, but they aren't telling them what to say. And there becomes this disconnect. So I think that's really important that you're emphasizing what they need to say. You're telling them what, where is the communication missing? And then for me, I found why don't players talk? They don't know what to say. They lack the confidence in what they're doing. They aren't bought in or committed to the philosophy or they don't believe in what you're doing. And so when you hear players talking confidently out there correctly on the floor, or if you see them helping their teammates, what they're supposed to be saying and helping them communicate, you know that they understand, they get it, and they've bought in. They understand what we're trying to do. And so when you're talking about rotations, those are the guys that we value and we find ways to get them on the floor. And so uh, one way that we teach that and hold guys accountable to it, you know, as coaches, we're so quick to jump in and just give our players all the answers. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> no, and, and I was so guilty of this early in my career. And so now I'm, I'm big on forcing players into problem solving and then trying to help them find solutions. So uh, for example, let's say we're guarding some, some type of action. A player doesn't know what they're supposed to be saying in their help position. Now, normally, you know, I'd stop it. Hey, you're supposed to be saying this and you know, okay, play on, but now, you know, I'll stop it. Hey, let's problem solve. Okay, where are you at on the floor? You know, where are you helping from? Sometimes that'll tell them what they need to say. Okay, let's listen. What are your other teammates saying? Let's start with process of elimination. And I let them figure it out. They come to the correct answer. And I just find that it helps them learn and retain the information better. And I've said this uh, a couple of times, I know, too, too, in conversations with other guests. I think one of the the nice ways about kind of that Socratic method of, of asking questions is it, it really gives you a lot of good insight into like what your players are thinking. And I think it's really good as a coach to know what your guys or girls are seeing on the court because they're the ones who are playing. And I think it's also a really good opportunity to know that if, if they don't know something or they're not they're not sure about something. I know to me as a coach, that's like a big a big like alarm signal in me that, okay, like there's this gap here. And, and by asking this question, I've, I've discovered that there's this gap in knowledge or something that you're not sure of. And I wouldn't be aware of that if I just sort of 
gave them the answer and just sort of just told them it i could actually find out from asking them that they don't know what it is and that's that's a big that's a big insight to me as a coach when when a player or multiple players don't know <laughs> when i ask them something and, and you're so spot on and i think that i think that's really important the, the feedback that you get from your players because they have a different viewpoint. They have a different mm -hmm. vantage point. And you to get the full picture and to learn and grow, you've got to view things from different viewpoints, different vantage points. So you can see something that they see differently in a practice or a game or a, a drill, a situation. And so I think that's really big to have those conversations. And I think that's really important for helping players grow and become problem solvers instead of just robots out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about on you, you mentioned about the on ball defender and, and I want to make sure I get this right, but I think you, I think you mentioned that it was about like two dribble moves they need to be able to defend for. Was that right? We say one to two one, attacking one to two. dribbles. Okay. Yeah. So just going to that even even level of, of of defense, what are you teaching uh in terms of on ball defense? What what points are you are you emphasizing uh, uh to make on ball defense as good as it can possibly be? What what do you think goes into making sure that a on ball defender is doing their job, um, including the one to two dribble moves and making sure that they're able to, to stop that? Yeah, I think that in our philosophy, the guy on the ball has the easiest job. You know, you just got to force them the way you're supposed to, and someone is there to help you. And so it's really big for us. You know, people hear no middle, and they yeah. think force baseline. And I hate that terminology using it with our players just because they have a tendency to just open up and still give direct drives to the rim. So – we tell them we want to force them to the corner. And so we'll use a diagram. We put a half court diagram up there and, you know, we will make a line, you know, with a three point line and we'll put a box around the, the rim and we'll say, okay, this, this is your house. Okay. The, the box around the rim, that that's your room. That's where all your valuables are at. And then the line, the three point line, that's the roof. Right. And we're trying to keep them out of the house. And so we are trying to force them along the roof line to the corner and don't want to just give them the baseline. So that's kind of the terminology we use. And we're we square them up with our head on the inside shoulder. The inside hand is digging for any kind of crossover. And because that's the quickest change of direction move, right, is, is a crossover where if they've got a between the legs behind the back spin, it's slower it gives us more time to recover and cut off middle. And then their outside hand is up looking for any kind of deflection on a pass. You know, we're trying to force it to that corner side. And if we can take away direct passes on the ball and get a tip, uh, maybe we make a slower pass where it's got to be a bounce pass or over the top. And again, that allows us to move from help position to ball position when our guy catches it. And I think that it's it's interesting you bring that up because the idea of like um a uh, force baseline cuz i've 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 watched actually and heard coaches talk about how <laughs> it, they'll have a defensive philosophy about about forcing baseline and then you know for one reason or another their players might just automatically think oh that means i can just give up the baseline and then they'll still give up those uh direct lines to the basket one way or the other so i think you know, emphasizing, like, as you mentioned, like the corner, like we're trying to avoid uh, any, any, any direct lines to the rim, whether it's baseline or middle or otherwise. I, I find that really fascinating that you bring that up because I've just heard that uh, brought up quite, quite a bit recently, how there's kind of that mental uh, gap or that mental mistake that kind of can happen with players sometimes when you say force baseline. And that's part of that clearly defining it. Mm -hmm. because they maybe they've had that in, in club or high school or wherever they were previously if they were a transfer. And so, again, that's our way of clearly defining this is the expectation, this is the standard that we want. No, we don't want direct drives to the baseline where they just get to the rim. We want to force them to the corner and make it tough for them. I think 
you might have uh, a couple people listening right now who might think, ah, coach, like this, this sounds really good. I, I love the philosophy. I love the idea, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a high school coach. I, I don't got the, I don't got the players for it. I don't have the, I don't have the personnel needed to do this. What would you say to somebody who's like, Ooh, could this really work in a high school situation? Could we really get our guys or girls to, to do this effectively in a high school setting? Sure. You know, I'm a prime example. I was a high school head coach last year and we ran it and we were successful with it. You know, when we utilized it, I, we cut our, our defense, we gave up 15 less points per game, you know, with a roster that graduated 90% of their scoring and they brought back two guys off the bench, graduated all five starters. So it works, but you have to be committed to it. You know, if, if you're not all in, and again, I don't think there's anything wrong with a pack line and force middle. Again, it's got to be something you believe in. So if this is something, if you're willing to commit to it and really get your players to buy in and sell it and teach it the right way, we've seen it works at the high school level. It works at the college level, but you have to fully embrace it and understand there's going to be growing pains. You know, I, to I told you earlier, you got to appreciate that patient, that patience. <laughs> and it's so important because it's going to be a struggle at first, but, and I'll also throw it out there with coaches that are listening, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'm big on sharing resources and everything. You know, I have no problem giving you anything that we have that can help you implement this and run it with your system and with your team. I think that's why the basketball coaching community is the best because I think we're the most selfless and, and willing to help and, and willing to share resources. So thank you for doing that. That, that, yeah, that. That's phenomenal. You, I'll probably be one of the first people to hit you up on it. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, individually, I know we, we spend a lot of time uh, with players talking about like individual offensive skill sets and working on, you know, their dribble moves, their, their shots or their ball handling or whatever the case may be. What do you think players can do individually to work on their, on their defensive ability and be able to be that much better when they're put in perhaps a no middle defense situation? Or are there things that you think even a coach could, you know, instruct or have their players do individually that could, that could get them uh, that much more effective in a defensive system? Yeah. When players in the off season, they spend time working on their offensive game. And so one way to separate yourself is, is trying to get better and quicker, faster, stronger to, get into those positions. And I think a lot of it, watch basketball. I think that's a really big one. You've got to watch the game so you can see different philosophies and techniques. And that's not just for players, but for coaches too. I'm really big on, I love watching other coaches on the men's side, the women's side, EuroLeague, and just trying to learn and see different philosophies. And at worst, you know, if it's something I don't want to implement, maybe it's something I'm going to see down the road. We play an opponent that does that, and I have a better understanding and appreciation on how to attack it or how to be ready for it. And then if you're a player, buy into whatever system your coach is running. You know, mm -hmm. ask questions. Seek that clarity. I have no issue with I love when players are asking questions because it means they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to problem solve. They're trying to learn and whatever that system is, buy into it, jump in with both feet. And it's going to be really tough for your coach to keep you off the floor. If you are doing what they ask defensively. I think that any player who wants to get better at defense, wants to learn more about defense or work on their defensive skill set, I think like any coach their ears would just like perk up immediately, right? <laughs> if they have a player who talks like like that or talks like, hey, I really want to work on this defense or watch film on defense or, you know, watch uh, watch ba live basketball and focus on the defensive part, I don't think there's any coach out there who would say, ah, oh, discourage their player from doing that sort of thing. Hey, we can fire up the film anytime they want, <laughs> work anytime they want. You know, I'll, I'll make time for that all day. That's funny. Uh, I ask pretty much every guest who I, who I have on when we focus on defense about rebounding and the idea of rebounding being taught as a skill versus rebounding being more of a mentality and, and something that you want to do. So I have to ask you about the, the art of rebounding. What, what goes into 
teaching that, coaching that? What is kind of your overall philosophy on on how rebounding can be taught or coached uh, to players? A lot of it is a mentality thing. I, I truly believe that. It's I want the ball ball more than you, and I'm going to go get it. And so I've been around some really, really good rebounders, and they have a knack for knowing where the ball is going to come off the rim. And so I have found that we try to teach our guys some of that to help them improve. And so, you know, we're talking at a basic level, okay, long shots equal long rebounds. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if they're shooting from the right wing, right corner, it's more likely going to end up on the left side of the floor. So try to get to that position. And, you know, just like everything in basketball, we all steal from each other and and try to make it our own. And so uh, I'm big with defensive rebounding that if your guy's going to the glass, it's a hit and get, you know, you make contact, go pursue the basketball. And if they're not going, you know, we'll tell them check and chase where, you know, you check, he's not going to go to the rim and you're going to go ball pursue. And so, you know, with how we guard the post, you know, we three, three quarter front the post, a lot of teams I've been on our point guard has been our second, third leading rebounder. Really? Uh, because huh. we tell them, we tell them to go in there and help the post out. Right. Like the, the biggest three quarter fronting the shot goes up, you know, we try to, you know, bury them into the baseline or bury them under the hoop, you know, with our positioning and it opens up a lane. And a lot of times point guards aren't going to the glass offensively. Um, you know, unless you're playing <laughs> Houston and they're sending, you know, five guys to the room or something like that. Um, a lot of the times they're getting back. So we tell them check and chase, you know, you check, you see, you, you look over, he's not going to the glass, go chase the ball and go, you know, help your bigs out. And so I think it's a lot mentality, but there are some things that you can do to increase their awareness and then try to put them in the best position to be successful rebounding. It kind of sounds like it kind of fits within your your overall defensive philosophy of players need to be bought in and 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 give the effort and and want to be, you know, successful within the philosophy of the no middle defense. I think that just kind of perfectly encapsulates just 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 how rebounding works and the philosophy has to also apply to getting a rebound as well. It's like a total defensive uh, philosophy that 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 the program has to have. And the old Pat Riley saying, you know, rebounding equals rings. And so, you know, when we won the national championship at Graceland, I think we were plus nine and a half on the glass for the season mm-hmm. with our uh, with our rebounding. And then our, the year at uh, Mesa Community College, when we won a conference championship, our tallest starter was six five. You know, so it wasn't like we were big athletic. We just had a knack for it. We emphasized it and we just had a bunch of gritty guys that were willing to go get their nose in the fight and and get on the glass. Let me ask you about uh, you talked about knowing your personnel. So I wanted to ask about the where scouting fits in, where where game planning fits in. What is the uh, process that uh not only you and the staff doing game planning and scouting, but also communicating that message to the players or having the players uh, understand the, the the personnel and, and in a way that they kind of know what to expect as well. Where does that game planning and scouting piece kind of fit into uh, the overall defensive picture? I think that personnel is so important when you're putting together a game plan. And so we really emphasize that with our guys. And so Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example for closeouts. You know, I took this from Coach Smiley, who's up at Northern Colorado, great defensive coach. We have three types of closeouts. And we have just labeled them super simple so you know exactly what they are. We've got drivers, we've got snipers, and we've got players. And so they can figure out pretty quickly, this guy's a sniper, what it means. And then we'll give them examples, you know. So, for example, we'll say a driver is Ja Morant, okay. He's 80% of his shots are coming inside of the perimeter. Um, you know, maybe he's shooting a good percentage, but he's shooting one and a half attempts per game. So when you close them out, it's a drive first guy. And then we'll say sniper Duncan Robinson, you know, like 78% of his attempts come from three. He shoots a high volume. Um, you know, struggled a little bit this past year, but the previous year shot over 40%. 
And so that's an example of a sniper. And then we'll tell him a player, Jason Tatum, shoots it well. He can drive. He can put it on the floor. He can shoot it. So you've got to be able to guard both. And he's, you know, shoots a good percentage, but he's mm -hmm. maybe 50, 50 from the floor, 60, 40, you know, 60% are coming inside the arc. And so again, giving them someone that they can visualize, they can see, and then we really just make it simple. Okay. They've got two snipers on the floor right now, two drivers, and we kind of tailor our game plan around that. And then when we present this information, I think it's really important guys see it three times. I think that's, okay. that helps with remembering things. So you know, we'll show them the day before, uh, the morning of the game, and then maybe at pregame meal, a quick review. So that way they get it three times before the game. You know, hey, 15, 20, and number three are snipers. Okay. And one of our philosophies is we don't give up open threes to snipers. So they've got to know where they're at on the floor. They've got to make them put it on the ground. Now, that doesn't mean just get blown by and let them walk <laughs> to the rim. Sure. Um but we got to take away open threes and make them do something else. And I, I like the idea of kind of simplifying the the terminology because there's so much, I feel like information that not only do we give our players, but stuff that is already in their head. Otherwise that to just have like simple terms and simple phrases that they could use and they can automatically know what to do with that information, I think just makes not only our lives easier as coaches, but definitely our players lives easier as well. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate indecision, confusion. When players know what they're doing and things are simplified, they can play free, they play naturally, they play off their instincts. So we don't want to make it super com complicated. Mm -hmm. And so we just found that was really easy. Hey, sniper, you know what that is? Player, driver, and they know right away, hey, all right, you got 15, you know, they're subbing in. Hey, you're guarding 15. Remember, he's a sniper. And it's just reinforces that and it allows them to play free which is what we need on the defensive side of the floor absolutely awesome uh before we hit our concluding segment i did want to ask about because i know that there's going to be some some people listening who might be looking to to really dive into this and really kind of implement it or or bring it up um th this defense and so i wanted to ask you specifically if you could kind of go back in time and talk to you your your previous self about about this defense and and what using the information you have now what would you tell maybe your younger self now about this defense that maybe would have saved uh the past you some some headaches uh if you had the opportunity to do that sort of thing uh, i tell you what, if i could do that i'd still have hair you know i wouldn't be bald <laughs> right now um I tell you what, I would tell myself, that's such a great question. You've got to, if you're going to buy into this again, you've got to make it your own. You've got to do what fits you. You can't be the previous coaches you worked for. Uh, you can't be, you know, someone you watch on TV. If you Baylor runs this, you can't be Coach Drew. You know, you've got to be yourself and you've got to take the pieces that you like that fit with what you want to accomplish. And so I think early on, I got so caught up with trying to do everything. And, you know, the old saying, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, really just simplifying things and allowing our kids to play free, where I was just trying to do too much early on, you know, trying to do this, this and this and, you know, for example, ball screen coverages, you know, we've simplified it where we have a, a main one from the, the slots down, we have a main coverage from slot to slot. And then we've got a backup plan for each where, you know, we tried to do some different things based on personnel and we just, you know how it is with guys in decision, they play slow. And I was yeah. putting them in, in a poor position. They weren't allowed to play off instinct. They weren't reacting because uh, they were paralyzed by making decisions and that they couldn't make quickly enough because I was it was information overload. So uh, I would say, you know, be you. You can't do everything. Find what works for you and be all in on it. 
Uh, that, that, that's, that's great. I, I, I like that a lot. And I, I, I've been in that, that situation before too, about the having players who are, who are indecisive, right. Or, or, or just that indecision in general, even me as a coach, right. Me being indecisive players being indecisive. And like you mentioned, everything just looks so slow and so half speed because I think, we're, we're doing too much thinking. And when we start start overthinking, overanalyzing, and, and we haven't committed to something, uh, it, we just look like we're, our, our feet are in cement and, and even me mentally, like I'm in cement. So I think that's a great, that's a, that's a great point. That's something I wish I could tell my past self to, to, to maybe, maybe up their confidence a little bit more so they didn't have that indecision as much. But I think a lot of coaches probably feel that way. Yeah, and that was something for me. It took self evaluation and reflection to to realize that it was me that was. It wasn't the player. It was mm -hmm. me putting them in a position to, uh, again, information overload where they couldn't make a correct decision because I didn't give them the tools to do that. And so, again, I I wish I would have known that early on. And that's something that you know I had to come to terms with and figure out. But you did learn it, so. That's great, right? <laughs> at, least, at least, absolutely, at least the journey did learn. That's awesome, <laughs> awesome, coach. I'm definitely gonna have to to to, have to get some resources from you and, and drop some links to some stuff here uh, uh, for this episode because there's there's I know so much uh, that still to get into with the, the even though we got through a lot, I know our time is uh, is still pretty limited. So I'm gonna have to get some some more resources from you there for for our listeners. But I do want to wrap up, coach, with a couple questions that I do ask every guest. So I'm gonna start with this first one, which is. Uh, thinking back on your coaching career, what is a moment from your coaching career that you think others listening would be able to learn from? That's such a good question. Um, you know, for me, I, I think it's, you got to take care of yourself. You've got to take care of your health. You know, you, you've got to find ways to manage the stress of this position. It's, it's one of the most rewarding careers because the impact you get to make on student athletes, but it's also one of the most stressful. And, you know, early on as a head coach, I didn't handle it well. You know, my, my last year coaching at Graceland, um, I got up to 280 pounds. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't working out. I was eating poorly. You know, it's so easy to to go through the fast food drive through <laughs> for lunch to get back to the office because you had paperwork and film and you know, everyone sees the 10% of the coaching that you get to do, which is the games, and they don't realize it's the other 90% of the job that can get you that, you know, can, can really make it stressful. And so when I left Graceland, you know, I was burnt out, you know, I didn't know if I want to keep coaching, uh, but I knew if I was going to keep coaching, I couldn't keep going this way. And so, you know, I made the decision, take care of myself, be a better husband, father, everything else, take care of itself. And, you know, I, I'm down to 195 now, you know, I, congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, uh, you know, I look back at pictures of myself from that time and <laughs> I don't even recognize myself. And, um, I touched, I touched on it earlier. A big thing was shifting my priorities, you know, and I think that's so important because those changes, you know, they happen over long periods of time, but all of a sudden you look up and you realize things are different. And so and now I'm making sure I'm doing exactly what I'm asking of my players each day. And, uh, some of those stress things, you know, I listen to a podcast each morning when I work out, uh, I try to read a book a week from all kinds of topics, because I'm, I'm always wanting to learn about things. And so uh, one piece of advice I would give anybody listening is, you can't pour into others, if your own cup cup is empty. Mm. No, that's, that, that's great. And uh, I imagine, not only, obviously, the physical transformation that, that you went through, I imagine your your just, just mental health, emotional health, your overall well-being, I'm sure, is is in a much better state uh, that than you were before. Because I know when that when that physical health is there, it 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 changes everything completely. A complete game changer, you know. And you realize after you've been away from it and everything, how much that was affecting you. And again, it's such a rewarding career, mm -hmm. but it can be stressful at times because you know, the livelihood of, you know, if you're at the college level, you have 15 student athletes, their futures are in your hands. And so you want to put them in the best position to, to grow as, you know, young men and women and be successful citizens and students. And so uh, that, that can get to you. And so again, take care of yourself, take care of your health, uh, take care of your family. I think that's something that, 
you know, that was a misstep in my career early on. And if you can avoid that, you know, I think that's really, really important. Absolutely. Coach, to wrap up, I give every guest what I call a 60 second soapbox, but I'm not going to time you. So feel free to go over 60 seconds, <laughs> but uh, it's a platform for you to kind of get out a, a, a final idea, a final thought, a closing message, something that you just kind of want to leave the listeners with. I kind of feel bad because you just, you just did a great job with what it is you just said for my previous question. So hopefully you have another one that you wouldn't mind sharing, sure. but I'm going to go ahead and uh, just kind of open up the floor to you coach. And I'm going to let you take it from here. I'll do my best 60 seconds, put a clock on it. <laughs> um, all right. So for me, I think it's important. You got to find yourself a mentor and you've got to find yourself a truth teller. So I was so blessed. Again, I fell into the ideal coaching spot at Mesa Community College to start my career. You know, I've gotten lucky. I fell into a great spot here at New Mexico Military uh, working for Coach, Coach Schooley. Who you work for is so important. You're going to take good. You're going to take bad from each spot. But who you work for and learn from, it really can make or break your career. You know, I, I've been in tough spots before and was miserable with my job. And I've been lucky enough to be in more good spots because of the people I get to work with. Find mentors that will hold you accountable and tell you the truth. You know, there's enough people in this world that will blow smoke and tell you what you want to hear. Find people that are willing to tell you what you need to hear. Yeah. And and be and just to add to that, because I completely agree, make make sure you're willing to listen to them too. <laughs> you don't you need those people. I know I've I've I know I've been in situations where you know I've wanted those people who who are going to tell me what I I needed to hear, and they did, and then I still wasn't willing to listen to them, and I should have listened to them. So so I I completely agree with you there. It's 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 that that raw honesty to have somebody to to say that to you. I mean, it may hurt a little bit in the moment, right? But man, is it invaluable. And I, I've had that. And sometimes you, you don't hear it at that time, but two years down the road, all of a sudden the light <laughs> bulb goes on and you're, you're glad you got it. So yeah. find that truth teller, find that mentor for you. Love it. Uh, Coach Off, I really want to thank you for for coming on here and spending some time talking, you know, program philosophy, talking about your coaching journey, and of course, uh, talking about defense. And I'm I'm really excited to, uh, you know, get 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 some resources from you that I'll I'll definitely be able to share with the listeners. And thank you for being willing to also uh, share things personally to to the listeners as well. Really appreciate that. Um, it sounds like you've got great things going on. Uh, at New Mexico Military Institute. Excited to continue to follow your journey and, and best of luck, Coach, with this upcoming season. Hopefully it's nothing but great things. Really appreciate it. Coach, I really appreciate this. And again, I'm big on giving back. So if there's anything, listeners, anything I can do to help you out, bounce ideas off of, you want more of this information, uh, go to the New Mexico Military website, look up my email, shoot me an email, uh, DM me on Twitter, Whatever you got to do, I'm more than willing to help. And, you know, I love to help other coaches and connect. Awesome. Really appreciate it. And really appreciate all of you listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. We will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.